I would say, than, for example, U.S. military involvement overseas. In fact, although I'm going to be using U.S. examples today, what I'm going to talk about affects the entire world, partly because the world not only imitates the United States in many ways, but because I'm going to be talking about areas where the U.S. is the leader, and because uh, it kills millions in this leading role. This ripples out and affects every nation in the world. So I, I'm, I'm excited about this topic in the sense that we don't talk about it much, but it's uh, obviously very horrendous to talk about killing millions. I think there are solutions, but I would like to first alert you to what the problem is. And basically, the problem is consumer protection. Yes, it's the protection that kills. Uh, and let's talk about that a little bit. Um, back in the 80s, there were a couple researchers who decided that the literature didn't have much in the way of showing how well consumer protection works. So Sidney Carroll and Robert Gaston decided they would prove to the world how well consumer protection works. Now, they did this in the United States because they realized that every state had different types of regulation. So they looked at, for example, electrician licensing. And what they expected to find was that accidental electrocutions increased in states that didn't have much regulation on the licensing of electricians. What they got was, pardon the pun, a shock. <laughs> <laughs> they found that just the opposite was true. The more rigorous the licensing requirements in each state, the more accidental electrocutions happened there. Well, of course, because they believed that consumer protection worked, they knew that couldn't be right. So they then went on and looked at dental hygiene in states that had different requirements for dentist licensing. Guess what? They found the same thing. Dental hygiene was poorer in states that had more rigorous regulation. They said, well, this can't be right. Let's look at optometrists. Let's look at blindness in states and compare it to the level of optometry regulation. What they found is that the more requirements there were to license optometrists, the higher the level of blindness was in the state. Now, they finally believed. So then they wanted to find out why this was. So they did some other studies, and what they found out is that when you have very rigorous licensing laws, you have fewer practitioners because the, you can't afford to go to the extra schooling, take the extra time, whatever. So you have fewer practitioners, and of course supply and demand dictates that the fewer practitioners, the higher prices. Higher prices means that especially the poor people can't afford it. So instead of, for example, calling an electrician, they either don't bother or they try to do the repair themselves and become electrocuted. So the result they found, which is a very important one for libertarians to understand, is that even though the quality might have gone up, less quality service is delivered because people simply can't afford to use the service. Now, think about this for a minute. We've talked about areas in which usually, maybe with the exception of electricians, this is not a matter of life and death. But what happens to the body count when we're talking about licensing of a proper service that is life-saving? What happens then? And to uh, share with you something that can be calculated and can be probably easily understood, I'm going to talk about the US FDA. Now, like I said, don't think for a moment that what the FDA does only stays in the United States. As we'll see, it has rippled outward, so this is very important. Here is a, a snapshot of their website, uh, their older website. After I gave a similar talk to some higher-up FDA managers, they actually changed their website. <laughs> and here, notice that they are saying that medicines, biologics, and medical devices are safe and effective when approved by the FDA. Well, I have to tell you that everybody at the FDA and everybody in the medical device and pharmaceutical industry knows to be a lie. Why? Well, how do you measure safety? Uh, is the drug safe when it has no side effects at all? <clears throat> when it has minor side effects? Or is it safe when 
It may cause death, but it may also save someone from a terminal illness. How do you define safe? It's not so clear. And effectiveness. Does a drug have to be effective in everyone to be approved? Well, if it is, we wouldn't have any approvals at all because I can assure you that no drug is effective in everyone. It doesn't have to be effective most of the time, some of the time. As you can see, this is quite arbitrary. So, how do you measure this? How do you measure the impact of a licensing of drugs? I'm going to talk specifically about that. Well, we're fortunate in terms of wanting to measure because the 1962 Kefauver Harris Amendments that were passed in the wake of the thalidomide tragedy, for those of you who remember that, um, actually changed the whole face of pharmaceutical development. And they basically are the regulations that are still mostly uh, responsible for what happens today in the drug industry. Uh, they wanted, they, they basically established uh, efficacy testing. I'm not even gonna go over all these things, but basically what they tell you is that the FDA was given jurisdiction over every aspect, basically, of the development process, which had not been true before 1962. And what happened, basically, with this CART is that the development time, the time it takes from a drug to get from the laboratory bench to the marketplace increased dramatically. Here, in blue, we see that from 1948 to 1961, if anything, the development time went down. This isn't really significant, but except to say that it wasn't going up. Okay. After the 62 amendments, as you can see, in the red bars, it went up all the time. Every decade, you're seeing bars that represent a decade, and it is still going up. This is because by giving basically carte blanche to the regulators, they can keep adding every year more and more requirements, and they do. Why? Because if they approve a drug, and it turns out to have side effects, and all drugs do, as you can see, <laughs> uh, and Congress gets wind of this, the FDA examiner who signed off on it is going to be called into Congress and be rated and possibly will lose his or her job. So the FDA examiners have every incentive to delay approval and make sure they can think of every possible test that they probably, that they could possibly do so that if the drug is brought forward to the public in a bad light because it has side effects. They can defend their job and themselves. Now, what's interesting about this is even the government agrees that the temporal regulatory burden is huge. Uh, you know, as you can see from the graph, the development times have more than tripled since these regulations were passed. And, um, of course, what happened is the patents were running out on the new drugs before the drug companies could recover their development costs because associated with this tripling of development time is a tenfold increase in the costs. Mm -hmm. This is because the drug companies try to, they have, they have to try to squeeze everything in a short period of time so they sort of double up on their studies. And uh, the Waxman Hatch Act was passed to help alleviate some of that. But that's not why I'm telling you about that. Act. I'm telling you about that act because it had a formula where they themselves, the government, calculated the temporal regulatory burden. And they calculated it at 84% of the development time. In other words, 84% of the delay in getting a drug to market is due to regulation. Even the government admits it. Now, think about this. You or your loved one is ill. You want a new drug, but it's in this 15-year development cycle, and you can't get it. What happens if it's a life-saving drug? You may die waiting for it. And in fact, that's what a lot of Americans did. Because we know how long it took to develop drugs before the regulations were passed and afterwards, we can calculate the delay for each one of the decades after the, well, I can see my PowerPoint's off a little, um, after the, the amendments were passed. We know the number of new drugs approved, what we call NCEs. These are not Me Too drugs. These are really new discoveries. We know the mean development time that it took to get them to market. And we know the delay due to the amendments from the graph I just showed you. So we can calculate the lives lost due to the delays for each decade because, because we know from past experience, now that these drugs have been on the market, we know how many lives they save every 
4.7 million Americans died prematurely waiting for drugs that were in the pipeline but not at the market because of these regulations. 4.7 million. Now, this most this part, this is the small part of what I'm going to tell you today. Um, and it mostly did happen in the United States because after the thalidomide tragedy, Europe was a little smarter and didn't change the regulations in the way that delayed development right away. But they started imitating the FDA as time went on. So this, this effect did end up coming in overseas. But 4.7 million Americans lost their lives early due to the delay in the development time. And this is, of course, a lot of people. Now, you might say, well, yes, but if these regulations save 10 million people, then it would be worth it, right? It makes sense. We can actually calculate what the expectations would have been without the amendments because we can look at the U.S. drug casualties for the 12 years before the amendments were passed. Now, there were four major uh, problems, drug problems, during that time. I have included in the body count not only those who died, but those who were adversely affected to a strong degree. And you can calculate then what the expectation would have been for the next 40 years since the amendments were passed, adjusting for population, of course. And what you find is that, at best, 62 amendments might have saved 7,000 people. And the far cry from the 4.7 million that lost their lives. Now, of course, in any data set like this, there may be a little error. Uh, but if the error is off by tenfold, this number is 70,000. Still not 4.7 million. If it's off 100 fold, uh, that's uh, 700,000. Still not the 4.7 million that lost their lives during to a delay. So you can see that this is a very, as we would say in the sciences, robust result. <laughs> now, let's talk about why this is. You know, why do unsafe drugs get to market in the first place? Well, in fact, it's not because they haven't done enough testing. It's usually because it's just beyond the knowledge of the day. In other words, animal studies don't always predict what's going to happen to humans. And when we do uh, small human trials to see if the drug works in people, we don't come anywhere near to tapping into the genetic diversity of the population. So when the drug gets out there and is widespread, all of these little differences start to show up. So it's actually very difficult sometimes to predict if a drug is going to be safe or not. And of course, I'm, I'm not talking about people who have debt. I'm talking about, you know, just straight ethical practices here. Now, 4.7 million I talked about was bad enough. But as I said, it is the tip of the iceberg. Another big problem oops, was loss of innovation. This is really where the rubber meets the road. And it's going to get worse, but this is a big <laughs> Because studies show that at least we've lost at least 50% of our innovations, the new drugs. Maybe with the cure for cancer, never made it to the marketplace. Um, and I say at least, because this is what we can show beyond a shadow of a doubt, because this is the number of drugs that drop out at the last minute for economic reasons. Which means that the drug company is saying, we can't do the last step, which is the most expensive, and expect to recover our development costs. So we're going to stop here, even though we know the drug works. Okay? So I think this number is closer to 75 or 80 percent, but I, I can't demonstrate that beyond a shadow of a doubt, so I'm going to stick with what I can demonstrate. And as I said, Americans got new drugs later than Europeans many times, and some drugs of course, are not appearing on the American pharmacy shelves at all. But let me give you an example about loss of innovation and how it happens. When I was working for the uptown company, I got a call from the FDA one day, and they said, Dr. Ruart, we understand you've just filed a patent for prostaglandins and liver disease. Is that true? I said, yes. You know, our work shows that these new drugs might be able to help people with liver disease. And they said, that is fantastic. There is nothing for liver disease. A couple hundred thousand people die every year because all we can say to them is go home and rest. That doesn't work, so they die. And so we're going to do everything we can do to help you get this through the process. Oh, I was like, 
This is great, you know, we're going to make it. But you know what? We never did. Because the FDA had to follow its own restrictions. And what the FDA required at that time was two studies in the United States in people showing that there was a certain statistical significance, you know, or benefit to our new drug. Now the thing is, you have to think about liver disease. It takes years to get, probably will take years to cure. Um, we were the first ones, we were the pioneers, right? We were the ones who were going to do it for the first time, so we didn't know what dose of drug to use, mm -hmm. how often we needed to treat, um, how long we needed to treat, how many years or months or whatever, and even how to measure it in a way that the FDA would find acceptable, because <laughs> liver disease is not easy to detect. Usually you have to do a biopsy, which means you've got to cut into something and take a piece of their liver to look at. You know, obviously not something you want to do frequently. And because no one had ever cured liver disease, there was not a good way to look at something in your blood and know that it was going to reflect what was on in your liver. So we had all these unknowns. And what we realized very quickly is even with the FDA's help and support, if we ran a study and ran it for years, which is probably what we needed to do, and we didn't have enough patients enrolled to get that statistical significance, we'd have to start over again. And that would mean by the time we got to the market, we would have run out, <clears throat> the drug would have gone generic, and we wouldn't have recovered our development costs. So the company made a business decision not to do the development. This story is repeated again and again and again in every pharmaceutical company with drugs that are breakthrough drugs. So this is why we, one of the reasons that we lose that innovation. Now, what is the cost of that innovation? I'm not going to go into the money costs, which are great, but let's just talk about the lives we've lost. If we think that those 50% of the lost innovations would have been 100% as effective as the drugs that are currently on the market, that would be another 16.5 million people. If we think they're only half as effective, it would have been 8.25 million. And if we think they're 25% as effective, uh, 4.1 million. So the very minimum is another probably 4 million people. But in all likelihood, it's even greater than this because some of the drugs that we've lost are the new, really new breakthrough drugs that would have saved lives that aren't being saved now. So this may be many times more than that, because those drugs, by the standard of today's drugs, might have been even better. So that's scary. But you know, I haven't even really told you the worst of it yet. Mary? Yes. Was that for what time frame? Um, oh, um, that is for the same 40-year time frame that we're using for the 4.7 million delays. And thanks for asking, because I didn't make that clear. But before I go on and tell you the even worse news, I just want to point out a little contradiction, that the uh, 1962 amendments appear to be neither safe or effective, although they require pharmaceuticals to meet that criteria. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it would be interesting to require the government, of course, to obey their own regulations. Um, in fact, all the evidence points to just the opposite, and yet, these regulations are still in effect. Now, before I go on and tell you the, the worst news, uh, I also want to point out that everything we've been talking about up to now impacts on the cost of drugs, obviously. But they also impact on the cost of health care. Why? Because a new drug is usually cheaper, even if it's high priced, than the other treatment would be. For example, when the first anti-ulcer drug came out, Tegamin, instead of having to have a $25,000 surgery for ulcers, which would have kept you out of work for a month or two, you now could take a pill, which cost you $1,000 a year. You'd probably have to take two years of it. And you wouldn't lose any work time. So you either pay $2,000 and don't lose work time, or you pay $25,000 and lose work time, which is more expensive. It's pretty obvious. So um, I won't go into the details of the calculation at this point unless somebody wants to see that in the Q&A, but the 62 amendments impose a cost in the double digits in health care, and I think it's probably between 25 and 55% of U.S. health care costs. And 
It's true for every country in the world, too. Why? Because the U.S. has traditionally been the innovator in pharmaceuticals. That means that this loss of innovation we talked about means a worldwide loss. It means that these drugs are not available just in the United States. They're not only banned in the United States, but they never make it to the foreign markets either. So if the U.S. isn't producing new drugs for the U.S. market, it's not producing it for the overseas market either. So this effect ripples out and affects all of our health. But as I said, there's I just scratched the surface, which is kind of scary. And we're going to enter into an area where I can't give you numbers anymore, but just being in the industry and knowing what goes on, I can tell you that this effect is probably bigger than the ones I've talked about so far. And this is the fact that the amendments change the way drug development is done. And, and for example, I've, I've put three indicators up here, we'll have some more, but these first three. We develop NCEs or new drugs, new chemical entities is what that stands for, for the technically inclined. Um, instead of promoting secondary uses for older products, where we know the side effects. So we start with a new compound where we don't know the side effects, which could be even worse than the ones of the old compound. And we don't use, um, we develop new drugs instead of, instead of using less expensive alternatives. I'll give some examples in a minute. And we also delay in utilizing new uses for what we call OTC or over-the-counter products, products that don't require a prescription. Well, let me give you some examples because it's not obvious to those who aren't in the profession. I was on an airplane once when I was working for Upjohn, and the gentleman in the seat next to me said, hey, I've heard Upjohn's developing these Lazaroid compounds. They're Lazaroids because we named them after Lazarus because they did so much. <laughs> we were thinking in terms of, oh, rising from the dead. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyhow, he said he wanted some. So I talked to the project manager because these compounds were not on the market. They were in development. And he said, no, we can't give him a sample. But just tell him to take lots of vitamin E. It does the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> So if over-the-counter vitamin E is going to solve this problem, why are we spending, it's up to $1.2 billion per new drug now if you count capitalized cost. Why are we spending all this money developing it? Because these amendments prevent us from taking vitamin E, which incidentally, Upjohn was the, one of the biggest producers of at that point in time, and advertising it for these diseases that we wanted to have these Lazaroids for. Why? Because in order to make those claims, the FDA requires us to jump through the $1.2 billion hoop on vitamin E. And the problem is, because it's generic, or off patent, or however else you want to say it, we can't recover our development costs. So we can't, can't do it. So think about how much more expensive that makes it. In fact, fish oil is another great example. Fish oil does a lot of wonderful things, for those of you who don't know it. And uh, actually, you know, something you might want to think about. Uh, but one manufacturer said, you know, I'm going to jump through the $1.2 billion hoop because I think I can sell enough of this stuff to get my development costs back. He did that, and, and he is able now, or he, I say he, the company is now able to go to doctors and say, our fish oil is the only one that's FDA approved, so you should recommend ours to your patients. Now, my sister actually qualifies for a prescription for fish oil, so she went, to, she, she went to her doctor, and the doctor said that, uh, uh, showed her that the copay was as much as she could go to Walmart and purchase the uh, fish oil for. The exact, basically the exact same thing. So it's crazy. That's how our health care costs are being being uh, moved upward. But, um, you know, there's even, there's even worse. Um, you know, when the amendments first came out, Bayer Aspirin already knew that aspirin might be helpful in preventing heart disease. So they went to the FDA and said, what do we need to do to, you know, market our little calendar pack? Look, we've got the right dose, you know, and everything. It's just like a birth control pill pack so nobody goofs and takes too much, you know. What, what do we have to do to market this? When they found out, they said, I can't do that. 
Aspirin doesn't have a patent, we'll never <coughs> cover our development costs. So the public waited, the, not only the American public, but basically the worldwide public didn't really hear about the beneficial effects of aspirin on cardiovascular disease until about 20 years later. Think about the people who died unnecessarily because bare aspirin was forbidden to sell that product and advertise and educate the public about how important that was. But the real clincher, the one that gets me, is what I call the American thalidomide. That most of you haven't heard of it. And even as I tell the story, you won't recognize it. You know, remember I told you that these amendments were passed because of the thalidomide trade. That basically what happened is a very safe sleeping aid uh, started to be prescribed for morning sickness because they found that it helped morning sickness. But if you took it during a certain one-month period of pregnancy, the children were born with missing limbs. This is a very big tragedy, and about 10,000 European babies were affected because it came out in Europe first. In the U.S., what happened because of the passage of the 62 Amendments was that people in, in the U.S. and really uh, to a large degree throughout the world were unaware of something we knew in the 1980s, which was that folic acid could almost totally prevent what we call neural tube defects. It's a type of birth, a birth defect like spinal bifida. Now, while the thalidomide babies lost a limb, at least they were normal in every other way. With spinal bifida, most of these children have to be institutionalized because they simply aren't functional. And, and so this talking about this and advertising this would have been a wonderful thing because a woman has to take it in the early months of pregnancy, sometimes when she doesn't know she's pregnant. Right? So really, all women of childbearing potential should have at least considered this. But the FDA told the folic acid manufacturers if they advertised this, they would get shut down. And even when the Center for Disease Control, another American government body, started saying, hey, we're going to tell people about this, the folic acid manufacturers were forbidden to even mention that the Center for Disease Control was making this recommendation. And of course, had they been able to do that, there would have been widespread advertising on the television. Young American women would have known about it, and we would have essentially eradicated neural tube defects like spina bifida uh, back in the 80s. But what ended up happening is about 25,000 children were born with these defects that didn't need to be, and probably as many were aborted because it's something you can test for. In, in the womb. So this was way more tragic than the thalidomide incident. And yet you never hear about it. That's why I call it the American thalidomide tragedy, because I think it's important to know. Now, the other thing that really was a big issue, just like I talked about the Lazarus and vitamin E, basically all the claims for nutrients were not allowed anymore in the United States. Uh, they were made indirectly. All the magazines would write about them, but doctors didn't learn about them in medical school because, uh, you know, that wasn't considered to be legit. Um, and vitamins can do a lot of things. You know, when I was at John, I was there in the years before genetic manipulation. So we had these rats that we had bred and fed well, so they were nice and healthy, and, you know, they didn't get sick. And so, you know, if we wanted to test our drugs in a disease, we had to make them sick somehow, right? Well, the only way we could do it is to take away their vitamins. This is a sign mm -hmm. that if you give the right vitamin mix, you're going to promote health, right? And yet, all of a sudden, vitamin manufacturers, many of whom were pharmaceutical companies at the time, couldn't make these claims. The first vitamin supplement in the U.S. was put out by a pharmaceutical firm. They wanted to name multiple vitamins, which I'm sure many Americans remember. I don't know how it was in Europe, but anyhow. So, as you can see, uh, and, and of course, alcoholism and the, the liver disease that comes from it, a lot of that can be treated with a proper nutrient mix. Uh, there's a lot of inexpensive treatments for disease. I've named a couple. Um, and again, they're rarely studied because you cannot advertise them and expect to recover your development costs. And, of course, the FDA spent a lot of time going after vitamin companies that made claims and shut many of them down. Now, 
You say, well, what does this have to do with us and other overseas? Well, guess what? <laughs> These regulations are now being um, harmonized throughout the world <laughs> through Codex. I don't know how many of you have heard of Codex, but I've put the website up there so you can learn a little more about them. They're a joint product of the WTO, the UN, and the Food and Agriculture Organization. And because of treaties, uh, they're, they, they've been adopted by the World Trade Organization. And basically, they're rules very much like the FDA rules for vitamins. And they've already been adopted in Germany. And, and the EU countries were supposed to adopt them a couple years ago, but fought it. So, what I'm going to ask you now, um, I'm going to show you some of the results in Germany, what happened there, and then I'm going to ask for your feedback, which you can give me in the Q&A if you'd like, um, because I don't know what's happening in other countries. I haven't heard in the last couple years of any changes, and I sure want to know. But let me just put my last slide up and tell you what's happened in Germany. And if there are Germans in the room and this has changed, of course, I want to know during the Q&A. In Germany, what they've done is they limit the amount of vitamins you can buy to what we would consider just enough to prevent the scurvy and other diseases that we know are caused by lack of vitamins. So you can't take the optimal amounts, because you can't take the minimum amounts uh, over the counter. Vitamin C, now I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what I take every day. Granted, I take more than most people do because we have a lot of cancer in our family. But to give you an idea of how low these are, so the, the vitamin C is 225 milligrams is the uh, highest dose you can buy it at in Germany. And I take about 10 to 15 times that much every day. Vitamin E, 15 IU, this is really low. Well. Um, you know, um, for cardiovascular disease, uh, you know, 800 units is, is about what you need. Uh, vitamin D, five international units. <laughs> I mean, this is really low. Uh, in fact, most people are now recommending at least 5,000 IU per day, you know, especially if you're having osteoporosis or something like this. Um, now, vitamin B12, 5 micrograms, uh, again, very low. A vitamin B shot, B12 shot might have, I don't know the exact number, but I want to say about 100 times that. Um, and then fish oil, we talked about that. Oh, fish oil hasn't made the approved list yet, at least the last I heard. So you can't get this wonderful thing. <coughs> so I have not been able to discover if, if these have been implemented in other countries. To the best of my knowledge, in the EU, they have not. But this is going around the world. It affects all of us. And I think as more and more research is done on vitamins and nutrients, we're going to find this is really a major effect. So I'd like to leave you with a thought that what kills more than any army of the United States are the consumer protection regulations that all of us have in each of our countries. And that the ones that the United States has implemented for food and drug not only are so onerous and destructive to, I calculate about one out of five people who die in the U.S. die early because they don't get the drugs they need. That means every family is affected. But the, this effect that we see in the United States of about one out of five people is rippling out to other nations either through imitation by their food and their food and drug administration equivalent copying that the US or through codex and other types of treaties. So this is something that affects all of us and I hope during the QA you'll educate me about what's going on in your country so I can be more informed and keep sharing this. And of course uh, I welcome any questions at that time as well. Thank you for your attention.